Hello. Welcome everyone. Oh, it's now. It's on. Jack, actually, you're going to be the one starting, so please. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to our presentation about the geometry nodes development process. So you probably all know, like, we started with the project like two years ago, and since then we have seen lots of adoption in the the industry and from individual artists all around the world. One of the recent highlights was the use of geometry nodes in the RRR movie, which is actually the, the biggest Indian production so far, movie production. And they used geometry nodes extensively for distributing assets all around the scene. Um, but first, a bit about our team. Here on the left side, we have Dalai, who is joining me today. Um, he's our product manager. He's mainly responsible for making sure that our priorities are in line with um, what the, the studio needs and what the stakeholders have in mind, like mostly Ton. Um, then there are Sons and me. We are the developers, uh, mainly responsible for actually implementing what we have designed, making things work inside of Blender. And on the right side, there's um, Simon. Um, who is an artist working for the Blender Studio as well. Usually is like the first person who tests our patches and gives us valuable feedback on how, like, what problems he runs into when he uses geometry nodes in production. Um, he made a, a, had a classroom earlier today. You can watch it online if you haven't seen it already. But then today we want to talk about how, how we got there because it wasn't a straightforward process. Like now we have a team and everything. But just like two years ago, that wasn't the case. And we want to tell the story of how we got from the time before geometry nodes. And that was a long time that I will tell um, to today and into the future, like how the process changed, how, how we managed to get like geometry nodes that is today in relatively little time. So where does it begin? It's actually quite hard to, to define where the, the overall project began. Like, the idea of everything nodes is kind of old already. Like the earliest mention of it that I found was from 2012. And even on the Blender conference in 2012, there was a talk about particle nodes already. Um, so yeah, that didn't lead anywhere. Then a few years later, um, I started working on the animation nodes add-on, which like brought proceduralism in many more hands of, like, of Blender users. And there was some new hope for the everything nodes project when I was hired by by Blender in 2018. But actually for the first few months, I was mostly helping out with the Blender 2.8 project, doing bug fixing and everything until 2019 when I was able to dedicate some time to the Everything Notes project. But at that time, we didn't even have an idea of what we actually wanted to do. So I was mostly tackling on my own some like more generic topics, like what could the future of the um, the modifier stack be, or what kind of mesh data structure would we need to allow procedural workflows. Um, but then a few months into that, we wanted to start an actual project. Um, and we mainly wanted to decide between like particle, new particle system, or procedural modeling. And now in hindsight, we, we kind of know that it would have been better to, to start out with procedural modeling. But back then, like we, we had to like decide and there was like on the one hand procedural modeling which would have been nice but the, the Blender Studio they like didn't have an immediate use case for it whereas for the for the party system where like they were for years they were strugg struggling with the old party system running into all kinds of limitations and then even other developers really wanted to get rid of the old party system so much so that in the development of Blender 2.8 the entire party system was removed at some point and then brought back a few d days or weeks later because there wouldn't be any feasible replacement in time. Um, so that's why I started out working on particle nodes. Um, so the project went on, it was mostly just me working on a, on a design, then writing a wiki post about it, asking for feedback and, on dev talk, getting, gathering some community feedback and then updating the design, building a prototype, and so on and so forth. Um, a few months into the project, I actually presented the, the current state of the prototype to the team. I had like a 90-minute session with all the, 
the artists working at the Blender Studio where they were trying this system. And generally it was like kind of fun to use. They were able to create effects that they couldn't create before. Um, and so everything was well, was good. At that time I also, like I was staying in Amsterdam for one year and after that I was moving back to Berlin, so working, working remotely. And so I just continued working on the system, improving it over time. Just a, a few months later, I came back to Amsterdam and we made a plan for how do we want to get particle nodes into, um, into Blender, like into the actual master version, not just as a, as a separate branch. So we had meetings with Dalai and Brecht and some others probably, um, where we made a to-do list. And then I, for the next couple of months, I started working on that. And we actually had particle nodes in Blender as like as an, you could enable it as an experimental feature. And then when it was about the time to decide to, to actually enable it, when I was back in Amsterdam, um, we kind of couldn't agree on the high level design anymore or there was like not really high level design of how everything fits together. Okay, we have a particle system, but how does it integrate with other simulations or with future procedural modeling and all of that. So since we didn't have that design, we didn't want to enable the system anymore. And the project was, was set on hold. Um, and now we were in a kind of difficult situation because we, um, we wanted to do this everything knows project, but we, but we were kind of back at the beginning at the design phase. Um, and we they had to desi decide how to continue. Um, we also noticed that other projects that were planned had similar issues. Like this is the big planning sheet for 2020. And there's like one row for the entire particles project um, that I mostly work on. And then there's, for example, a row for the, for the hair project. And yeah, it was all planned out. None of that really happened in the end. And you can also see that like for every one of these projects, there was essentially one developer assigned to it. And that turned out to be one of the issues in the end because if you assign one developer, especially if the developer is working remotely, um, it's kind of an isolation. And it's, it's hard to, to find the right balance between like getting feedback in and thinking about all the, the entire design when you're working on your own extension, you're responsive for, responsible for the entire project. Um, so yeah, as we as mentioned, it would like looking back now, we we now know that like it was probably not a good idea to to start with the particle nodes project or to develop it that far without having the the entire picture in mind. And now we were at a a first big pivot point where we we had to decide: do we like do we want to continue the design of the particle nodes project, or do we just forget about that for now and start something completely else. Um, and that was kind of a tough decision to make. And in the end, we decided to go back and reevaluate our initial assumption about that it would be better to start with particle nodes um, and decide, okay, let's do geometry nodes instead. And then Dalai also talked to Andy about it, like what needs that they actually have in the past open movie projects. Um, like, and then figured out that when, when Andy was talking about the particle system, that he really need a new particle system, he was mostly thinking about scattering things. Um, whereas like when I was thinking about particle system, it was mostly about points moving around, reacting to events and everything. There was kind of a fairly big misalignment that would have been solved by um, like having a better like shared mental model of how things should work. Um, so we tried to address that and that's when we started building a team and so on, and then I would give ta uh, the live take over and talk about how we try to improve the, the process from there with everything we have learned so far. Excellent. Thank you. Having to get, putting together a team wasn't about just adding more people to the problem, right? One of the problems that was highlighted on this 2020 planning that we had too many projects running at the same time for people working by themselves. And that doesn't scale and doesn't make sure that everyone has a full autonomy to be able to build everything they need to build. So when you're thinking about the team here, at first I got together with Irun. Irun is one of the developers at the Blender Institute. And he has an experience in work with Scrum in the past. 
and said, you know what, let's try this Scrum thing. You know, I keep hearing about, there was some buzz through some of the HR consulting we had at Blender at the time. And I, let's, what would it take for us to try this new methodology? First, we need a team that it's not only about the amount of, amount of people, but about the different skill sets they bring to the table. So sure, Jack was naturally the lead developer. We need more hands on board. Hans was someone who was, who was already involved with the user interface part of Blender. So it was, uh, you just invited him over. At the time we tried other developers, this was more rotating seat. We had Sebas, we had uh, Sebastian Parbo. Then we had uh, Pablo uh, Basquez helping with UI and uh, overall design testing. And we have, which for me is the most important role in the team, which was the, the, the designer, the feature designer was the role played by Simon, Simon Toms. You might know him from the overpacked <laughs> jump to nodes training session we had earlier today. And he was a must for the team. It, the, having him on board and made sure that every step of the way, what we were doing was validated in production was literally production ready because you just take that and use it right away. I was at the time playing the role as a, a PO, product owner is a name within Scrum. But as uh, Jacques said, it's also a bit of a product journey for myself. I was like learning on the way. And we are all just trying to bang our heads together, try to build something better. And then a few weeks later in the early October, 2020, we officially started. One thing that, you know, we know what happened in 2020, not only there was COVID, there was a Tom getting the, his leukemia diagnosed, he's super fine, but the year itself was very erratic. So we, a lot of the planning that didn't work before was also because it could have worked if everything went according to the plans, but guess what? <laughs> we cannot predict everything that's going to happen. And then we tried something different. So we tried, okay, let's work in those very small incremation, incremental intervals. Is the Scrum methodology. Let's get together every day for a daily. This was also important because Hans is in America, Jacques is in Germany. The rest of us have been based here in Amsterdam. So it had to build this sense of communication, shared context. We had uh, sprints of one to two weeks. So we will, we will do some planning, but it's not a planning for three months down the line. Let's, let's try to do something and let's see how people react to that. And we started from the right beginning to try to work with the studio for their upcoming project. At the time it was a Sprite Fright to see what we could build that they would love to use. This was a bit, a bit of a men mental shift because the Blender animation, the Blender Studio has to use Blender for everything they do. It's not that they, like, they have a lot of say on, hey, I don't feel like using this tool today. But this is a bit, this is not the best way to build a good relationship with the people that need what you're building. So we said, you know what, let's leave the existing particle system there. We are not forcing anyone to switch out of it. But what if we build something that's so compelling and so designed to address the needs they have? that they'll just have no choice but to switch to that. This was early October. Eight weeks later, we've ended, we, we basically finished the jump to Nodes project, so to say. So one of the problems we had in Blender before with planning is that we also had those projects that were going on forever. Jack mentioned the simulation, the particle project was already going on for almost two years. We had uh, the asset project in a similar situation and so and on. So we said, you know what, Tom? We're gonna work in a team. Don't worry, we're gonna finish the project in two months. And we did. But there's only so much you can do in two months. A lot of this, of course, was already very impressive. We already had Pebble scattering uh, of, uh, working at the time. We had basically different systems interacting with each other. And a lot of this was possible because of the work previously done by the particle simulation project. So we just we're building on top of that. But we also acknowledge that this is finished. This is master ready. I think we are already in master at the time. I would guess so. Yeah. So people download the Blender, could already use this. Sure, you can only do five things, but those things are supported and they're supposed to work nice. And at the time you also wanted to build the trust from the leadership, from the stakeholders. You wanted to 
is a path to be walked together. Now, we want the autonomy, but we need to kind of show that they can have the tranquility to trust the autonomy to the team. So we're discussing at the time, it's easy if you watch this later to, uh, on YouTube, you can see the text. But basically, you're like, should we go for procedural modeling? Should we go for hair, whatnot? Or can we continue with what we wanted, which is to wrap up the main use cases for Sprite Fright and address some usability issues? It's kind of what we went with. Shortly after, so this was two weeks after that email, so I read in the second big sprint we had, and they officially started to use geometry nodes for the Sprite Fright project which was, was a big thing for anyone and, uh, that you had been using Blender for long enough, know what it meant with the old system. You had to rotate things in strange axes, be in the origin. If you were to change anything in a corner of the world, it would affect the distribution of everywhere else. So for it was a big victory. We mentioned that this is a project that's been going on for two years, but throughout the way, we kind of tried to celebrate those little, little wins. And in the course of one year, so when we started in, in Amsterdam, so late October, when we officially started the jump node projects, and when Sprite Fright was released, we managed to officially have the debut of jump to nodes shaping up to what we have it today. We had the first uh, Blender release in 292. We have the splash screen with the arc of Art of Erndale. Finally see you here. It's spoiler alert, the file doesn't work anymore because we changed things drastically afterwards. <laughs> and we have the celebration of Sprite Fright using that in a production. And sure, now we have uh, feature films using it, but still at that time, this was mind blown. A lot of this is not by chance. Right from the beginning, we had the schedule of the Sprite Fright project, the production, and we had access to this every step of the way. So this is 2020, and you can see we knew when set layout, set design was going to finish. So we say, okay, so anything we want to do regarding set dressing should be done by that time. Oh, we know they're gonna do some character, some VFX. Oh, if they want to use the jump to nodes for VFX, let's work with that to our advantage. So it's not a set on stone planning, but is that those are moving targets we realized would be beneficial for us and for the project, and then of course for Blender at large to pursue. For anyone that hasn't seen Sprite Fright, go watch it, it's on YouTube. And originally, we tried to be at the same time cautious but ambitious, like looking at the storyboard, like right in the pre-production of the project, which, what could have been done? What could be done with geometry nodes? With, there was not even such a name at the time, but what could be done procedurally? What could be done with better set dressing tools? The obvious cases is for indeed set layout. We thought maybe we have a lot of spider webs. There's some bird, which is one of the characters. There's some very ambitious uh, VFX, like the hairspray, some crawling snails. That's like, that's crazy. Let's, let's, not, let's not go that far. But let's see, let's consider what if. In the end, Everything but the hero care, hero assets. So the bird nest and the spider web, in the end, they wanted the full control. So it's so-called hero, hero props. But everything else was using was uh, used geometry nodes. You can find a lot of those files online and as part of the Sprite Fry production. This was, for me, one of the first surprising uses of geometry nodes. For me, it looks like people working with uh, metaballs but in like on steroids pretty much. And then Zimon was already a very accomplished uh, node artist. I don't know if that's a name. <laughs> He's a great of shaders and everything else. And then he started to get the, the hang of the system and, and said, you know what? I can do that with jump to nodes. I think that's his, what's his talk name. I can do that with jump to nodes. And then he was already doing the VFX for that. The, in the end, we didn't have a crowd simulation, but they have a crawling simulation in the film. Ha. And even that, even though it was a close-up shot, they end up using jump to nodes for the, the snails to individually interact with the body of, I forgot his name, Rex. And to top it all off, top it all out, uh, Zimon even used jump to nodes to help with adenoising 
At the time, Cycles X wasn't merged into Blender. So the sound of the shots using the old cycles uh, were suffering a lot from noise, given the render time we were allowed. And basically he had a, yeah, he did this. He used jump to nodes for some things we haven't even considered before. <laughs> I see some people know what they're gonna <laughs> talk about here. <laughs> As I mentioned already when I mentioned the splash screen, I mean, not everything is, is you know, just a walk in the park or not everything's perfect, right? And of course, we are telling a story here which more highlights the, the good moments, but it's also important to be grounded and remember that a lot of things didn't go so well, or rather, a lot of things had, a, had an impact and had some friction throughout the way. One of them is the attributes and fields. Right in the beginning, the Blender Jump to Nodes design was very simple. We have a geometry in, a geometry out, and everything else is a black box. You know, we had this mental model of a spreadsheet of vertices and attributes, let's call them so, UVs, position, rotation. And it was, it's, it's beautiful, it's very elegant. This come from Tom, a lot of these. However, when artists, and, and it was also very data, data flow oriented, you know, data in, data out, data in, data out. But when artists started to use these for their production files, you know, to really be constrained to a pure data flow pipeline for nodes, first gonna lead to this very, very horizontal stream of information. Also means, means that any data that you need to create in the beginning of the node tree, you need to find a way to parse it all the way to the end of the node tree, leading to a lot of uh, cluttering and a loss of uh, readability in the node tree. So we said, okay, we already have people using this for production. Like all the entire of Sprite Fright was already built on top of those assumptions. But what would it take to rethink this now? Because we are doing something for the next 10 years, at least. And this has been like, this was six months in, like one year in. It's a time we can afford to use to our advantage. Um, we even considered to be backward compatible so to say, so we could convert the old files. We had a little poll in the dev talk in the, one of the development uh, forum channels. And people said, you know what, it's fine. You don't need to worry about that because this was working for the Blender 2.93, which is an LTS. So we knew that if you have a production file that was using the old pipeline, it's okay. It's gonna be supported for two years. And for anything new you start, let me tell you how you're gonna do it from now on. And we tried, like we really tried different ways to persist on the data flow. This is some of the examples. At the time we were sharing a lot of those in dev talk again. To tr and we have some prototypes. And this is one of my favorite ones, have the expandable socket that you could just get the data there. I still like it. <laughs> we end up la uh, landing on what we have today is the so-called field design. I won't go over it specifically. You can read all about this on the blog. It's also what we have in Blender. And let me be like, come out in the public and say that for so many times I was saying like, I hate fields. I said that so many times to, to Jacques and to Hans, I hate it. Because I know it can work, but also I know that's mind boggling and it's gonna be like, ah, poor people. But it's, it has a, it's, a, it's always a trade off in a way. So it allows people to do more and if they know what they're doing, it, it's even more intuitive. It just has a mental model which is more abstract than data in, data out, which you see every day. Now, we talked about pivoting here. We're gonna be mentioning two more pivots at least in the course of this talk. Um, I think for all of them, and that's something that is important throughout the way, which is about checking the assumptions. Check what exactly, and this talk I had with Andy that helped us with pivoting was like Andy, when you're thinking about the new particle system, what does make you excited about it? What is it? What makes, and then like, it was just set dressing. It's that simple, that simple. But wasn't the hurricane, because in every one of the open movies, there's one massive VFX simulation scene. And you know what, he, he made his, he made his, he's already made his terms with those problems. You know, it's always gonna be a pain in the ass. One day we, we have a better simulation system in Blender. 
But what goes every day in right from the pre-production all the way to the end is this set dressing, set scoping. So checking the assumptions. And important to acknowledge that having not only jumped the pre geometry nodes, so the simulation particle in Blender helped us to move fast, but also to decide to do something integrated with Blender right from the beginning. So we didn't have a new stack of effects to run in objects. We didn't have a new system. We just have a new modifier. And that's why with only a handful of nodes, people could use every other modifier they were already using it and already doing very powerful like tree generation right from the beginning, right when you have five, 10 nodes. So it was very important uh, throughout the whole process. And the communication with the stakeholders, I still believe the field change, so when you had this big rollback in terms of design, could have been av um, not avoided, approached early on into the project. A lot of this was still a mismatch between the stakeholders vision that gets done in a little bit what we're building. And it's also our mission, maybe this was part of my work, to know when to really bring uh, uh, everyone that has a say in the process to really look at what we're doing so they can sign off for the better. But, no, no, <laughs> come over, come over. <laughs> trying to think of a good segue. But Sprite Fry was finished, right? And Blender is an open source project that needs its this reason to exist is a community. So how do you transition from having this closed interaction between these people working every day together to be more approachable and more accessible for the module maintenance in the long run? For that, Hans, please. So Blender already has this module system. So there's modules like the animation module or the user interface module, and they're each working on their own area of Blender, and they have autonomy to some extent to decide what happens in that area. So the natural owner for the Geometry Nodes project is the Nodes and Physics module, because it's sort of taking modifiers and making them more general and integrating them with nodes. So that's where we took Geometry Nodes project. And it's sort of like, how do we continue the Geometry Nodes project even though it's done? I mean, that sounds weird, but really the sort of core implementation of geometry nodes as a new concept was finished. It existed, yet there is still so many more things that it needs to do, even to this day. I mean, geometry nodes isn't finished, but the core implementation of nodes dealing with geometry is done. Um, so that's where the community comes in, because, you know, two people can't do everything by themselves, obviously. So right from the beginning, we had people um, committing smaller nodes or smaller changes to existing nodes or changing the UI to make it more friendly. And everyone out there can see things that we couldn't see. So part of what we needed to do was make our decision process more available to everyone else. And that's sort of what you can see with the work board on the left. So there's all of our bugs and all of our tasks. And on the left is really important because that's the community tasks. So that's tasks that we have sort of talked about as a team and decided that, okay, we sort of agree on the basic idea here. Anyone can take it from here. Anyone who can, well, write C++, but. <laughs> um, and then in the middle, there's our module meetings. So every two weeks we, or maybe it was one week at the time, but every so often we'll meet and then get more people involved. We noticed we did the dailies, but someone who's working on Blender as a hobby can't join at you know seven in the morning or three in the afternoon every single day. So the, every two, the every meeting every two weeks makes, po makes it possible for people who don't have as much time to still be involved in the project. Um, so these are some of the patches, I think in like maybe early 2021, um, there were already people contributing and some of those people are still around contributing to geometry nodes today. We owe so much to them and the different perspectives that different contributors have because, like I said, we can't think of everything. And one great example is the curve tools. Um, so this is sort of, so, hmm, okay. <laughs> I came to Blender, um, obviously a continent away, with a different perspective because I hadn't really been to the Blender studio. So I had my own interests and one of them was curves. 
And turns out curves are really useful in a procedural pipeline because they're like wires, paths, pipes, they're all curves and you need those so much when you're doing anything with geometry. Um, so combine that passion with contributors who can add plenty of these nodes and we had support for a new object type in geometry nodes. So we already had the mesh object support. We already had point clouds, which was sort of a prototype from two years ago that we could use in the modifier stack. Um, but we have this existing curve object in Blender and we have edit mode. So we should just be able to use that with geometry nodes. So we made a curve system because the existing curve data type in Blender is sort of limited. It doesn't support attributes, which means Yes, you can set the tilt and you can set the radius and you can set the soft body goal weight for every single control point. <laughs> but it didn't have this idea that was essential for geometry nodes where you can add any data you want. So we added a new curve system and it turns out that the curve draw tool and the curve pen tool are so much more powerful and used so much more than we ever imagined. This is one example. Um, a city, medieval city generator by Ellen Wyatt, where you just draw a line and it creates a, you know, a medieval road. And then you draw another line and it finds, oh, where do they intersect? Let's put a plaza there. And it's just magical. All of these things are just two strokes drawn by users. And that's sort of, that's where the, the power of a node system comes in. Because with every new node, you're not just adding the one feature in the new node, you're multiplying that feature with every other thing that was already possible. And that's why you can make a city from scratch. And, you know, we could keep showing this sort of thing. Um, there's this river generator that was going around on Twitter recently. Um, and then there's more stuff using this curve draw tool. You can make chili peppers. You can make roads with lamp posts spawning on the sides. You can make paths for cars and so on. So to recap, we can't imagine everything people want to do. That's why there are, you know, 100 people in this room. Um, and sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes the curve draw tool is so much more important than you ever would have thought. And when you use existing features and you don't you know, make a new node system that can't interact with modifiers, but instead just make a new modifier, things can be useful much earlier on. And it turns out that the communication with the community in, uh, like, as part of the core process is really important. And also nodes, they're very atomic. So you can have 10 people working on different nodes at the same time and they're not necessarily editing the same files. So the node system lends itself well to the open source development process. Okay, so I mentioned Geometry Nodes was done as a project, so we needed a new project, and we keep coming back to this particle system, which is a little bit awkward and limited and not quite flexible enough, but also the Sprite Fright project, the, sorry, not Sprite Fright, Project Heist, um, had this idea of a main character, Anar, who has this scruffy beard, and wouldn't that be a great thing to do with a new hair system? Um, so it turns out we've been working on curves for a while and what is hair but just lots and lots and lots of curves. So, you know, our ge the geometry node system could support hundreds, thousands of curves, but once it started getting to hundreds of thousands or millions, then it just slowed to a crawl. It was way too slow. But it turns out Brecht, um, years earlier, had made a prototype for a hair object. And that's just a really efficient way to store lots of curves. But if I went back a few slides, you could see all those curve nodes and they weren't using the new hair type. Uh, so we went through all of the existing nodes and converted them to the new hair type. So that's sort of one of the pivots till I mentioned where we really have to go back through thousands of lines of code and make it more efficient, you know, 10, 100 times faster. And that's when you can start to edit 100,000 curves and use the existing geometry nodes pipeline with them. Um, so this is the main character, Anar, and you can see all the different curves objects. And there's the S there rather than curve, which is the existing object. So that's a distinction we're going to try to remove as the old curve, curve object gets phased out and is replaced with curves. Because what is it? The, the existing curve object can already fit multiple curves, right? Uh, so that's the idea. And then along with the geometry node support, 
um, we needed a way to just interact with this new system directly. Because yes, one, way, one place we could have started was let's add a um, geometry nodes modifier that you just add to an object and it creates a hairstyle and it's automatic and it's all procedural and magic. But that doesn't really work when you're in a production and you want to move this one hair out of the way. So you need a sculpt mode to interact with it directly. So the new curves object supports sculpt mode and then there's a bunch of new tools that um, we implemented. And then we were working, so at this time I had went to um, Amsterdam for the first time for a couple of months and we worked really closely with Jacques and the Blender Studio and actually Andy who was sculpting this character and Simon who was making these procedural tools with geometry nodes and when we made a sculpt tool and you would say well it's not quite strong enough or I would think the smoothing should work this way and that's how we made something that I think is useful for what it does um, and you know it's finished. <laughs> um, the curved sculpt system is finished. Obviously, this is where the sub module comes in again and takes these features and you know rounds out the corners and makes it possible to do to sort of fulfill all these other ideas. But at the time, um, Jacques and I had been working on this for a while, you know, iterating on these sculpt brushes, and it was good, but we were missing something. And that was sort of the idea of making tools to make tools. So when we iterated on a sculpt brush, you know, we made the sculpt brush better, but we didn't make uh, uh, like n many new things possible. And that's what happens when you add nodes and when you add an, an asset system to bring, bring node systems to more people. So we had a retrospective going back to this um, scrum agile methodology. Um, where we were like, okay, what is actually, what, what are we passionate about? What do we want to do? And we thought that maybe it's actually, we want to f focus again on nodes. Um, and so nodes should come to hair curve sculpt mode. You should be able to build a sculpt brush with a node system. You should be able to, we should be able to implement curves edit mode with nodes. So that just takes us back to building tools to make tools and it makes, us much more flexible in what we can implement. And so to wrap up, the curve system, the hair project, used geometry nodes. We weren't building something entirely new. The communication with the studio was essential to make something that's actually useful for real people. And we can be happy and implementing stuff that people like, but we can be even happier if we're expanding what Blender can do in a fundamental level. So from here, Delia will talk about what's next. The final part of the presentation. I just want to add something about the happy can be happier. That's something I learned from, I learned from, from Ed Catmo has a fantastic book called Creative Inc. And he mentioned that during Toy Story 1, everything was fine. And a lot of the team uh, decided to leave afterwards, part of the production team. Like, I thought everyone was happy. Well, we were, building something fantastic, groundbreaking, we can endure a lot of uh, shitty conditions in the process of doing so. So, oh my God, and this for him is one of his blind spots, he didn't see that coming. And for me, the same, I, th I was super excited, Hans was, you know, came over for a few months, and then we're now using our exper expertise to build the new hair system, which is something, something which was a long, long way coming. And then suddenly, I could see that, I think it was, uh, it was particularly Jacques. Jacques was more like, you know, I could see like less motivated. I could see that, like, let's get together. Let's talk, what is it? Like, how come you're not so excited? And it, as it turned out, is this that he can do a lot, of, he wouldn't complain. He can, uh, again, he's still doing something fantastic and he just fight a lot of, and doing a lot of a uh, suboptimal working conditions. But what if you can do, make the best of uh, both worlds to, to just say that really, really is good for the community and for the people working on it. And what happens next? Like how can you go from this, it's a successful project in terms of adoption, but it's kind of a bumpy road. Can we use this to other parts of Blender? Can you continue to innovate? Interesting enough, I, uh, one word I have here is the cross pollination. This I got from, uh, from bees but also from uh, Spotify. 
Spotify has a very famous video called the Spotify Engineering Culture. It's a master class on Scrum on how to actually work in a company at that size. And one of the key getaways from that lesson is about teams and how the teams get to interact with each other, how each team has its own autonomy, but they naturally cross-pollinate and adopt the good practices from the other teams. So the moment we had to switch from a more Scrum-like development to the module kind of development, we say, okay, we need more well-structured meetings. How do we do that? Well, the animation module is already doing this for one, two years. Let's just copy that format. There were also other projects which throughout those years were also trying to start working with a team. And we know they were also then using a lot of the things we we're uh, promoting and trying ourselves. The other thing is what I call steam rolling. So I think it's a natural process. We have a team working together. People see how this is re received and the colleagues start to, I don't think they get jealous, it's different. They want to get, they also get uh, contaminated. It, it spreads out to the whole team like, oh, I want also to do something exciting. I want to help building Blender as a whole. But it's important to remember that we are not building one part of Blender. Right? In the end of the day, our mission is to make Blender as a whole better. So we are making Blender better and that is uh, something that spreads to the rest of the team. And then we managed to take the needs of drum to nodes to help to put some of those low, long-standing projects back into the agenda. Um, who here was on the, on the talk in the morning by Zuga Master on rounded caps? A few people. In the very end, he was trying to find rounded caps and ways to do that nicely in Blender. One of the solutions is with drum to nodes. But it still would be nice if it, if he wouldn't have to append the jump to nodes every time he starts a new project. So, and it's something we have been promoting. We want more people to use the asset system so they can reuse jump to nodes. It's made to be reusable, to be this very nicely encapsulated, you know, abstracted away functionality that you can use in multiple projects. So I say, you know what, let's build on top of the existing asset browser. And why not we have jump to nodes in the add menu if they happen to be in your asset, asset library. So this, for example, is something that's happening now. We have a patch that's gonna be part of Blender 3.4. So any jump to node system you have in one of your asset libraries, it just seamlessly integrated with the rest of Blender. Similarly, we also had uh, other long-standing projects like the Blender project, which is for allow for a something like Sprite Fright to have shared settings, shared asset libraries that can be used for the whole production. But we never got to prioritize this for Blender because I don't really, I can't guess why, but it never got to that. But because we want them to use more jump to nodes and we want to use jump to nodes as assets, that means that we want them to use the asset library, which means the asset library needs to be able to link assets and not just append. It's one of the, and for that we need the Blender project. So just a, this is kind of this dependency chain that, you know, it helps to have a project that's just steamrolling. Hey, we need this, let's try to gather resources and try to make everyone else also excited about this. The other is the brush asset, the old brush manager. Now we're calling it brush asset, which is the idea of having, a, you know, brushes in Blender which are not in your Blend file, but they're as part of Blender. And then if you want node-based brushes, we need a better brush asset system. So this is the latest, greatest thing we have been doing at the Blender Studio. I'm due to write a blog post about this, so more people are gonna know about this soon. But here's more to illustrate how one project can really trip, trickle down into everything else. And every one of those projects, like the principles we follow, are very simple. And it's something that Blender itself always had but with mixed results, but really try to be incremental. Try to make something that's always working. We are working on master right on the I think, third or fourth week of the project, meaning that everything we did had to be finished in the sense of had to be documented, had to be working already. The UI had to be with all its buttons working. And this is the opposite of batch designing and batch building when you think, okay, those are the 50 most important nodes. Now let's build 
every one of them at the same time. It can be efficient, but in the end of the day, might never get you to the point where you want to go. It can work sometimes, not always. The teams uh, aspect I mentioned, and again, it's not about the amount of people, but about the expertise. We needed to make sure, and that's very scrum -y. We needed to make sure we have all the, we did, had no showstoppers to do the work we needed to do at every sprint cycle. Of course, we needed to check with the stakeholders. Of course, we needed to validate with the community. We needed to communicate. But we knew that we didn't have to wait for some, someone external to the team to design us a logo, to design us what's the user case we want to use here. So the same way, right in the beginning, we could leverage the pre geometry node. Later, we could leverage the existing tools, Blender, Curves. I think we're in a moment where you can leverage this success story to try to um, help other projects moving forward. And again, communication, communication, communication. If before we had to talk to, to the stakeholders, we still have. If before we had to talk to the community, which we still have, now we are once again looking, trying to look at Blender as a whole and go outside our bubble and say, hey, modules, hey, uh, fellow developers. It's one of, one of the reasons we had this talk here is aiming at developers or technical artists which are involved with the modules, which are a few here. So like how we can you know, learn something together. And one of the recent criticisms, criticisms I've read about Scrum and Agile, that sometimes it's too myopic, sometimes it's too focused on, okay, you gotta follow this methodology by the rule, that means by the book, by the letter, so it means you need to do everything only incrementally, and that might go against big disruptive changes, you know, because if you have to really be disruptive, that might not be compatible with just the business as usual. But I think the role of the disruption comes from the design. And even though it's called Blender development, the Blender developers, you need people that know C++, but the development is, is way more than writing software. It's about designing, it's about you know, having clear mental pictures, mental models, learning how to work together. So I think the design is also a key part of what we do. If you want to know more about the process, we have been documenting a lot of this throughout those past two years. There is a video about the, the read about the process uh, on the code blog. <laughs> we have even a blog post about the icon for geometry nodes, which was something at some point. We even use geometry nodes for some of the hair to icons in Blender. Geometry nodes was used even for the um, conference, the, I forgot the name of the little plant. And Besides the content of this conference, uh, Zimon also has a training which is very nice in the Blender Studio website, highly recommended. And there are a lot of other jump to notes talks uh, in this Blender conference, so get, you know, you can, uh, there's a lot, a lot to be learned. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Jack and Hans, please. <laughs>